Hello, everyone. Yep, so we're going to talk about, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. sounds like it. Mm, cool. Uh, so we're going to talk about rendering Blender scenes on Lambda and how we got there. Uh, the agenda for tonight, and it's going to be a short one. Uh, who am I and what is, what is Theodo? Because this is a sponsored talk. So <laughs> it is a sales pitch, after all. And then I'm going to uh, explain in a, a little bit what Blender actually is. Uh, why we were using Blender, what we we're trying to do with it, uh, which options we considered, and how we ended up making it. Um, so first, who am I? I'm French, I live in New York. Uh, I've been living here since 2018 with my wife and my 364-day-old son. Um, slide updated today, big birthday tomorrow. Um, as a child, I wanted to be a car designer. And so that actually pushed me to use like Blender, but other better software at the time in high school and do a lot of 3D. Uh, but I became a software engineer instead. Big disappointment. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm an AWS community builder. It's a cool program run by uh, AWS, where they give you access to all sorts of resources to help you produce good content for the community. And I am the CTO of the US branch of Theodo, which brings us to what is Theodo. So we're a, a software consultancy created about 12 years ago uh, in Paris, mostly PHP at the time. Uh, if Jeremy was here, he would like, it's, this is about PHP and about containers on Lambda, he would hate it. Um, nowadays, we don't do so much PHP anymore. We're uh, 600 people across uh, the US, the UK, and France. And we're mostly engineers, about 450. And we work with all sorts of companies from like pre-seed pre startups to uh, very large corporates in the finance industry, but also aerospace, taxi companies, veterinary clinics, the French government, you name it. Um, and we're an AWS consulting partner. So what is Blender? Uh, Blender is a very cool piece of software created in 1994 by this Dutch person, Ton Rosendahl. I'm not sure I pronounce it really well. Um, and he created as part of his, uh, at the time, private company. Um, it was like early days for 3D, but not so early, and uh, created this very complex software. And the, he had to raise funds at some point because complex engineering requires engineers. Um, raises funds, uh, the 2000 bubble bursts, and his company goes bankrupt, and he buys back the source code of Blender to the initial investors, and he, with like not his own money, for a few hundreds of thousands of dollars. And he makes it open source and creates, in 2002, the Blender Foundation. And so nowadays, uh, the, so uh, the last number they give, and they, they, they don't really monitor that too much, but the, on blender.org, there were 14 million downloads of Blender, and you can get it from other places. So it's really a really, really big community. Um, it's very popular with students and people who have no money, basically, because it's free, and all the other alter alternatives are terrible or terribly expensive. Um, so it's very popular, and because it's been around for so long, actually, it's being adopted inside companies that you wouldn't suspect use it. And these companies end up also financing the project, which makes the project even better uh, every year after year. And there are countless applications of Blender. It's an amazing tool, but it looks like this. Uh, <laughs> which I guess like to a, th to a designer, this gives you the same feeling as like going to the AWS console a few years back. I think nowadays it's not too bad, to be honest. People like to <laughs> trash it, but I like it. Um, so fortunately for us, uh, no, actually I want to point, point out a few more things. They don't have as many services as AWS, but there are like lots of tabs. You can do many things inside Blender. You can do modeling, animating, texturing, rendering, there used to be a game engine built in. They removed that. Uh, many, many things. But very importantly, we don't, get, we don't need to look at it so much because everything inside Blender is accessible through a Python API. Uh, and that makes what we did possible. So we're grateful for that. What did we do? So uh, we have a large uh, American customer there, a fashion company. And 
um, as all fashion companies, they need to create new products every season. And fashion is made of textile. So they have people around the world who look for new fancy textiles. Uh, and so they go around different places, they find samples, they scan those samples. And with like very special scanners, um, so not like this, but that gives you an idea. <laughs> and um, they want their designers who are probably located somewhere else. They want their designers to create new pieces of apparel using those uh, textiles. So we built for that client the 3D software that uh, designers use to create uh, new pieces of uh, clothing. And so the only thing I'm going to talk about today is the generation of those small thumbnails on the left. Like the whole, it's just a very small piece of a big puzzle. Um, so how do we get to generate those small thumbnails in a way that's um, repetitive and that's um, standard enough that as a designer, you can look at always the same shape for different fabrics. And you can see how the light interacts with it, whether it's velvet, leather, or cotton, or whatever. Um, so how do we do that? Based on those like 2D scans, high fidelity 2D scans. Um, the answer is we take a, 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 a standard blender scene, which represents a piece of cloth uh, on a certain shape. And we apply the, 3D, the texture that we got from the scan to this shape. We render it, store it into an S3 bucket. Um, and then the, the 3D design tool they use, we make it just load all the, uh, all the thumbnails we have. And the designer can then click on the different part of the dress here and choose which fabric they're going to apply to which part of the dress. So this was our mission. Um, this looked like a fairly simple architecture diagram. Uh, and we're like, but how do we do that compute, that cog? Like, what, which tool do we pick? And there's always so many options to do anything on, on AWS. So um, we, we, we considered four options, which are laid out here from the server most to the server least. Uh, trademark on that. Uh, <laughs> so option one was, OK, we just like uh, set up an EC2 instance. Uh, that has Blender on it, and whenever uh, there's a new image, a new a new scan available, we render, we spin a Blender, render the scene, throw the output somewhere. Um, we're like, okay, to reduce the cost, we could use a sp uh, spot instance that we spin up only when we need it, because it's not like they're going to go scan materials all day, every day, continuously. Right? It's just a limited number of per of people. Uh, option three was. Oh, actually, to make them spin up faster, maybe we could use Fargate. And then we're like, mm, actually, we could even put, if, if there's a Blender version that's containerized, we could put it on the Lambda function and not tell Jeremy Daly. So that was option four. So we did some uh, basic comparison with the, um, one option that was actually quite important is that with Blender, so 3D rendering is like very complex science and there's like a lot of research. And it's only a few years ago that Blender's rendering engine started su supporting a GPU rendering, which is tremendously faster uh, than CPU rendering. And so we just wanted to check how much faster it was. So we took the cheapest uh, G40, and G so GPU-enabled uh, EC2 instance we could get. Uh, we took this very uh, basic example scene available on Blender.org's uh, website, and we compared the numbers, and so with like a four-core uh, CPU, it goes, and, and the GPU, the basic GPU they have, it goes 10 times faster. Uh, so in terms of like cost per render, it's almost 10 times uh, cheaper. So that was promising. So we thought, okay, it would be nice to have maybe a GPU-enabled solution. Um, but at the same time, the lack of flexibility and the, like the, the speed of scaling of, of EC2s were, um, we thought that there could be a problem. So we also looked at the numbers on the Lambda function, the, and we thought, OK, we're going to take the most expensive Lambda function, because it's not that expensive after all. Uh, so a Lambda function with six vCPUs would do the same job in half the time of the cheapest GPU-enabled EC2. So we're like, OK, it's not too bad. And the cost is quite high compared to a GPU-enabled instance, but it's maybe OK. 
So we went back to our four options and said, okay, we're not going to take spot instances because they have no GPU option. So if we're going to use an EC2, we might as well have a GPU. Um, we also discarded the Fargate option because actually there's also no GPU enabled and it has fewer vCPUs than a Lambda can have. So we might as well just go for Lambda. So all in all, we had all these considerations and depending on what your uh, workload looks like, on what your, uh, your application is, uh, you might have to pick EC2. In our case, we could pick Lambda because we were rendering fairly simple scenes. If you're using Blender, it's likely maybe you're rendering a movie and you're gonna need 100 gigabytes of memory and that's not gonna fit in Lambda. Um, if you're using something very complex, maybe you're gonna need it's going to take three days to render one image, and you're not going to pay a Lambda for that. You're going to pay an EC2. In our case, small images, unpredictable load, a bit like this. Um, so it would fit in the memory. It would uh, be nice to spin in like a few uh, Lambdas instantly, like the container image, even though it's quite big. The cold start time is in the hundreds of, well, it takes one second between the invocation and the moment when Blender actually starts rendering, and then it takes a, about a minute to render the image, which sounds crazy when you're using a Lambda to like, make it run for a minute, um, but it's actually not too bad for us. And, and also, it was just extremely easy to uh, set up. So I'm gonna quickly walk you through the files that if you wanted to do this at home, uh, you would need to do. This is all built with the serverless framework. Um, so a few highlights on this. Uh, kudos to the neighbors right here. The New York Times uh, tower is next door. Uh, the R&D team at the New York Times maintains a great, I don't, know, I don't know if it's great, they maintain a Docker image <laughs> of Blender with all versions. Uh, so that made our life quite easy. Um, you can pick this, by the way, yeah, the CPU enabled or GPU enabled version of Blender for that. There is no GPU support on Lambda yet. Maybe at some point there will. So for now, we stick with the CPU version. Um, and then what do we do in there? We simply um, trigger one handler. Is this the code for the handler? It is not. This is, oh yeah, sorry, I can see it here. Uh, so this is our serverless.yaml file describing kind of the architecture. So there's not much happening. Uh, we have an S3 bucket. Uh, we have the function that renders it, that renders the scene. And from the S3 bucket, we get the sample scene and we also store the output. And this is what you do. Our, our handler simply passes um, whichever parameters. So you can, we, our, this Lambda function, in, in this case, you can pass it in, in the event. You can say, hey, I want this size of an image. Um, and then you pass that to the Blender uh, command line and then um, this is how inside Blender you say, hey, render an image, store it somewhere. And that is it for today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>